All right. Good morning, church family. How's everybody doing today? Good to see you. Good to see you. If I haven't met you yet, my name is James. My wife Cody and I pastor our Cabot campus. And uh, if you guys will, will you please help me welcome everybody that is listening online. Thank you guys for joining us at church. Good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, I, got a, I got a picture of my family. I uh, wanted to show you guys just so you, you know what we look like. So <laughs> that, that one almost made our Christmas card. It was like that close. But my wife will be thrilled that I put that picture up in front of everybody to see. Just, so, but I want to let you know that, that that look that is on my face as I am desperately looking towards the heavens, <laughs> that is the real face of a majority of men when you say family picture time. Like that is what is happening in our hearts. It's not easy. And so uh, that's my wife, Cody. She usually doesn't hold her nose up like that. Uh, And then that's London, our oldest, uh, the redhead, and then Grayson, our youngest girl, uh, Reeves, who looks completely lost and confused. (laughs) He's not. And then our son, Corbin, who hasn't figured out that the dab is so last season. And so (laughs) that's my family. Hey, uh, so, so much... uh, So thankful to be here on our first Sunday service of 2018. Uh, Man, I'm so honored to be here. And here's the thing. In in about a month, we're going to be celebrating 17 years as a church. And I want to let you know, I've I've had the the privilege of an honor of of serving and pastoring here for almost 14 years now. I'm so thankful that I've got to do that under our amazing lead pastors, Pastor Rick and Michelle. Can you guys give it up for them real quick? We're thankful for them. Love you guys. But I also want to let you know that, that the same passion and zeal that Pastor Rick had for the Lord. When I very first met, I met him in Colorado and heard this vision of reaching a state and said, that's what God wants us to be a part of. And the the same passion and vision that he had then, he has it now. And it's even more strong. And I just want to tell you, you need to buckle your seatbelts because going into 2018, we're going to see God do some amazing things. Amen? Amen. Well, it is is the new year. It's the new year. So, uh, how many kids went back to school this week? Kids went back to school? Raise your hand if you sent your kids back to school. Okay. How many of you guys love your kids? You love your kids? How many of y'all really love school? How many of y'all love school? Amen. If you got young kids, don't judge me. You know how I'm, you know what I'm talking about. So, but it is the new year, so, you know, time to shake the dust off all those workout clothes, <laughs> a.k.a. running errand clothing. You know what I'm talking about. That's what you really use them for. But uh, it, <laughs> it's New Year's resolution time, <clears throat> and so, <clears throat> excuse me, I know a lot of people have been making their lists, and, and I don't usually do this type of humor, but I found this hashtag on Twitter. It's called resolution fail, hashtag resolution fail, and, and I, I, just reading through these, it just makes you feel like you're a better human. Um, <laughs> it makes you feel really encouraged. Because some of these people. So I I wanted to read some of these to you guys just to help you feel better about yourself this morning, okay? Uh, Well, this one one just is a good observation. Oh, the irony of going to the gym, watching cars circle the parking lot looking for a closer parking spot. I mean, (laughs) kind of missing the point on that, I think. Another one, my New Year's resolution is to get all my friends to put on 10 pounds so I look skinnier. That's a smart person right there. I, I think that's brilliant. My year's, New Year's resolution was to make better decisions. Four days in, and I'm stuck in a baby swing at the park waiting for the fire department to show up. <laughs> the, you know, what, what's even more funny about that? This person was by themselves <laughs> doing this. Poor person. Uh, wow. My New Year's resolution was to lose 15 pounds, and as of today, I only have 25 pounds to go. So... <laughs> My New Year's resolution was to read more, so I turned the closed caption on my TV. That, <laughs> winning, winning. I did the same thing, so I'm, I'm definitely reading a ton this year via Netflix. Thanks. Thank you, Lord. Well, uh, no matter what your New Year's resolution might be, how many of you know we need Jesus to help us this year? Amen. And uh, I want to let you know that the next weekend, uh, Pastor Rick is going to be starting a new series on worship and prayer. 
And we believe that this is incredibly important for us to engage in as we prepare and position ourselves for what, everything that God has for us this year. And, and I know, and even in my own life, as a pastor, you guys may think that I've just got all this time set aside where I'm, you know, seeking the Lord and praying on a con- consistent basis, but, but I can get really busy, and if I'm not really intentional, I can miss out on the most important thing, and that is seeking his face to understand what he wants to do. And I know in your life, you may feel like, man, I just don't have time to seek the Lord for prayer, for, for worship, for fasting. And I just want to encourage you with this. You need to quit something so that you have time to make this a priority. It's that important. And, and we believe as pastors that God is going to do some amazing things. But we know if we don't get before his face, we're going to miss out on what that is. And so we want to encourage you to be a part of that. Make it a priority to join us for worship and prayer. And you'll get more details about that later. I want to go to this text in Philippians 1.6. This is what it says. And I am sure of this. That he who began a good work in you will. Everybody say will. will. He will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And so already, even if you walked in here really insecure this morning, and you're not sure where you stand in relationship with God or, or anything that's going on in your life, there is a promise right here that God says that he will bring his plan to completion in your life, and that's what we're gonna talk about today, but we gotta answer the questions like, how? And what is our part in that? It's important to answer this question. How confident are you right now going into this new year in your relationship with God? Like if we were gonna rate your relationship with God right now, if we were gonna give it a score from one to 10, 10 being the strongest, where would you rate your relationship with God. And I'll be totally honest with you, there's been a few years in my life, even in ministry, where I was like a one or a two going into a new year. And, uh, and, and that can be the case for, for a lot of us. And here's the thing, I mean, it's especially hard to be confident going into the new year if the last year stunk. Like if it just was full... Uh, of loss and heartache, and like if your life looked and sounded like a country western song, it is hard <laughs> to be confident that the new year is going to be any different. But I do believe that we can have confidence in this. We can all relate to what it feels like to be overwhelmed going into the new year. You know, I think social media feeds into this a lot. Because now you're seeing what everybody else is doing, how everybody else has all these goals and aspirations, you know. And, and as a parent, you're doing the best you can just to try to keep your head above water. But you got people posting stuff like, this year my seven-year-old son is learning Mandarin. And you're like, well, awesome. I'm trying to teach my seven-year-old not to headbutt people. So, <laughs> But when you look at all of that, you can just feel like, I just have so much to work on. And it can be incredibly overwhelming. But you can be sure of this. Like Paul says, what God has started in you, he will finish it in spite of what it looks like in the natural. In spite of situation and circumstance. If there's anything that you need to be confident in this year, you need to be confident in your relationship with God. And I'm convinced that God wants to do something new in all of us. And I'll tell you this, I want to see something new. I want to see something new in my ministry. I want to see something new in my marriage. I want to see something new in my kids. I want to see something new. And we can. And Paul said that he's faithful to do this, but we have to do our part. Because the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. God's not going to force his way in. He still needs a willing vessel. So Paul, he gives us some insight into this later on in Philippians in chapter 2 where he's talking to, about spiritual growth, but he's, he's talking to people that are already believers. And he says this in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. He says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Okay, that just means with respect and reverence and awe of who God is, understanding that you don't want to miss out on anything that he has for you. It says, for this, for it is God who works 
in you both to will, and that's important because that's just the desire, that's the longing, that's where your thoughts are, your heart, your emotions, the will and to work, that's the application. That means it can't just be in your heart, it can't just be in your head, it's got to be something God wants you to live out through your actions and through your work for his good pleasure. It's all for his glory. At the end of the day, that's what all this is aiming towards. You need to understand, though, that he doesn't say to work on your salvation. Jesus already did that work. You don't have to do that work. But what he is saying is you've got to work out what God has already worked in you. You've got to strengthen that. So where does it begin? Like, how can you apply this in your life? Well, it says in Philippians chapter 3, No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on one thing. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Okay, so we're going to answer some questions today about how do we have boldness, confidence in our relationship with God and in the work that he's doing in us. And the first question I want to ask is this. In your past, what is the one thing that you need to let go of? What's the one thing that you need to let go? Because here's the thing, your past is your past, and everybody's got one, but your past does not define you unless you let it. And Paul is saying, in order for me to move forward, I have to, I have to forget what is behind me. And we don't know what Paul was trying to let go of. I mean, it could have just been his reputation, because remember, Paul, before he met Jesus, he was persecuting the church. Uh, he, he was essentially responsible for sending Christians to their death. Uh, maybe that was it. Maybe it was just his identity, you know, because he was kind of in the upper echelon of spiritual leadership around the Sanhedrin and, and the Pharisees. And, and so he, he was well off and he was very accomplished. And maybe the thing that he needed to, to let go of is his pride. Maybe it was just pain. Maybe it's just the pain that he had already endured for the sake of, of the cross. I mean, because you think about it, Paul, man, he went through it. This guy was whipped and beaten and shipwrecked and stoned. I don't mean, but like with rocks, like <laughs> thrown at him, left for dead. And so maybe it was just, man, I... The, const, the, the literal scars of the reminders of all the pain... Maybe he needed to let go of that. And maybe in that, he was just saying, man, is this worth it? Is this worth it? Maybe he was doubting at different points that, that God was actually going to do what he said he would do. And so maybe he needed to let go of doubt. Have you, any of you ever doubted before? Just doubted what God was going to do or that he was actually going to do what you believed that he said that he was going to do? What's the one thing that you need to let go of so God can continue to do his work? It says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. This race that God has set before us. You know, I talk to people every week as a pastor and, and in these conversations, I can just tell the weight that they're carrying. And, and they're coming for help. I'm also aware of so many people that walk around like they have it all together. But they are so heavy with weight. They're so heavy with things that are keeping them ensnared and entangled. What's weighing you down? What's weighing you down? Maybe it's a sin or an addiction. I think it's time for confession. The word says that if you will confess to God, then he will forgive you. But your healing comes when you confess it to someone else. And I believe there are so many people in this room, you are one honest, wise conversation with an honest and wise person away from receiving your healing from a habitual sin or an addiction that is in your life. 
you're one conversation, one sentence away from just admitting that it's there before God is going to step in and heal you supernaturally. I believe that, but you have to be willing to let it go. What about bitterness, unforgiveness? You know, all of us have had that. We've talked about that recently, just how important it is. At one point or another, it's time to speak forgiveness. It's time to speak forgiveness over the situation, the person, the hurt. And here's the deal. Sometimes when you speak forgiveness, your heart's not going to be all the way there, and your head's not going to be all the way there, and that's why it's faith. But you speak it in faith because you understand that God has forgiven you, and because God has forgiven you, it's time for you to let it go. Let it go. Let it go. <laughs> and here's the thing. I think some of you are here. You want, to be, you want to be healed. You're even asking God for physical healing in your life. And we can always trust God for the outcome, but the thing that is standing in the way of him moving is unforgiveness. And until you release that, he can't bring his healing. You need to let that go. What about mistakes in your life? Just mistakes in your life. A lot, a lot of us, we just... We can be really hard on ourselves. I can relate to that, man. When I make a mistake, it just, I'll lose sleep. And I've made a lot of mistakes. This last year, I've made mistakes. I've made mistakes in my relationship with my wife, Cody, just not being there for her the way I need to and, and loving her the way I need to. Well, not to mention mistakes as a dad. Oh, my goodness, that list is long. Like daily making mistakes raising my kids. It's hard raising kids, people. I'll give you an example just to make you feel better about yourself as a parent. So, <laughs> we were coming up to Christmas, and my kids were all making their Christmas list and everything. And my, my younger son, Reeves, he made his Christmas list. And he, he actually came and presented this to me. And he's just like this cute little kid. He's like missing a tooth, and that makes him even cuter, you know, blue eyes, blonde hair. And he's just kind of like... Oliver asking for more, like, just kind of come and presents his list to me. And at the very top of his list, the number one thing that he was asking for Christmas was that the flat tire on his bike finally get fixed. You're welcome. <laughs> so how many of y'all know I fixed that flat, amen? You're wrong. I bought him a whole new bike. <laughs> yeah. I said, boy, the reason why I haven't been fixing your tires is because I've been planning all along <laughs> to get you this new bike. Daddy sold some stuff to get it, but, you know, it, Brand new bike. We've all made mistakes. All of us. And if you think you haven't, you probably don't have any friends. But we have all made mistakes. But here's the thing. Your past, it is simply a point of reference. It was never meant to be a place of residence. And it is something that you need to be able to see because it reminds you of where you've been and where God has brought you. But too often, we hold on to our past like this. And God can't work with it like that. But I think we should hold it like this. It's a point of reference. There's a great story that I think illustrates how important it is that we're moving forward. In 1954, Roger Bannister was the first person to break the four-minute barrier on the mile. People had said that it would never be done, um, that you can never break four minutes, be under four minutes in the mile race, and he did it. Um, but then just a couple months later, another man named Landy beat his time by 1.4 seconds, which is a lot of time when you're talking about track and field. And so they set up for the two of them to get together to settle, like who's really the fastest, who's the best at this race, and, uh, and so they, they started the race, and they were pretty even all the way through it. But going into the last lap, this man, Landy, was out in front. And coming around the last bend, he was still in front. But on that last bend, he had this question 
in the corner of his mind that was kind of haunting him, and that was, where exactly was Bannister? Where was he? And so he looked to see where he was, and as soon as he looked, Bannister passed him. And then Bannister won the race. And I think that is a great illustration for us. That thing that is kicking around in the back of your mind, trying to tempt you to look back, that is a thought that needs to be taken captive in Jesus' name. Because God wants you to win your race. God wants you to win. But you've got to keep looking at the race and going forward. Another question, in your relationship with God, what is the one thing that is missing? What's the one thing that's missing in your relationship with God? In Mark chapter 10, there's this story of this pretty successful guy that comes in the presence of Jesus and, and he has this question, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And, and Jesus starts talking through like some important things. But, and this is not the way it went, but I'm kind of paraphrasing what I think the attitude of this young man was. Because Jesus is like, well, one of the things that you need to do, and the guy's like, I did it, got it, done. Well, okay then, well, then another important thing, no, already did that, got it, done, did it. And so this, this man was feeling really confident in himself, and so... Jesus went to the heart of what was really going on. In Mark chapter 10, verse 21, it says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. And this is so important. We need our conversations with people to be led in grace and love. Because Jesus is seeing right through his outward obedience and straight to the heart of what was really missing in his life. And Jesus says, one thing you lack, he said, Go sell everything that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. There's this one thing that's in the way. At this, the man, man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Now you have to understand, we're not saying that there is anything, with being, anything wrong with being wealthy. The issue is not having wealth. The issue is when the wealth has you. And in this case, this man's success had his heart. And that was the one thing that was standing in the way. God specifically showed him that he lacked one thing, and that was he needed to redefine what success truly is. And I think that's a good question for you to ask yourself. How are you keeping score on what really matters? What's the most important thing that's going on? And does it align with the kingdom of God? How do you keep score? Philippians 3, 7 says, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. This is Paul. If anybody did some big things for God, some incredible works, Paul did it. But he's saying all that is just nothing. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And none, none, nothing that I've done, good or bad, can compare to just being in the presence of God. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. If you do a word study on that word, rubbish, it, it's just like filth. The worst kind of filth. This is what he considers his good works that he has done. He considers as filth in order that he might know Christ. That he would gain relationship with him. Man, when it comes to your relationship with God, what's the one thing that you lack? Like if you were going to finish the sentence, the one thing that I'm lacking or the one thing I need more of, and then you fill in the blank. Maybe it's passion. You've just lost your edge and you're your pursuit of God. Or, or maybe it's, it's vision. You're, you're just not sure where to aim your life right now. You don't know where to go. Uh, maybe it's around giving. Maybe, maybe it has to do with, with your tithing and your offerings where you just haven't completely surrendered your heart to God in obedience with the tithe. And, 
and being led by the Holy Spirit when he's asking you to give more. Maybe that's the area where you're just having a difficult time trusting God for your future and what he's going to do. Maybe for some of you, you, you need some accountability because you've gotten off by yourself. And when you're by yourself, you are in a very dangerous spot. You're very vulnerable to what the enemy would try to do. My parents got divorced when I was 13 years old. And, and uh, the church that we had been in to that point, uh, it was nothing like this church. And it was one of those situations where when my parents got divorced, we kind of got shunned. And so we, we left that church. And uh, we still went to church. My mom moved us to Texas. My dad was in Colorado. And I kind of bounced back and forth between the two. And, <clears throat> and I still went to church. I still went to church. Like, I had to go to church. <laughs> I still was at that point where I was being made to go to church, even when I resented it. But I was going to church. But a couple of years after my parents' divorce, I, I realized I wasn't hearing the voice of God anymore. I wasn't growing in God. I wasn't having any kind of revelation from God. Uh, even when I would try to read the Bible, it was just so dry. And as I began to seek the Lord and just pray about it, I felt this is what the Lord gave me. He said, James, you're really good at going to church, but you don't really love the body of Christ. Because if you love the body of Christ, you would have relationship with the body of Christ. And I was going to church, but had no relationship with anybody there. And the one thing that I was missing was I needed to be invested in relationship with other people. And it was that year that I went to my very first life group. And I'll tell you, that life group changed my life. Because up to that point, I had grown here and there, but it was God manifesting his power through relationships with other people, real relationships with other people that I grew the most. I don't know what you're missing, but maybe that's it. Maybe the thing that you're missing is you're really good at attending church, which is important, but, but you're not actually completely in love with the body of Christ and allowing yourself to be open in relationships with people. Maybe that's what you're missing. I think another question to answer is this. In prayer, what is one thing that you desire from God? What is one thing that you desire from God? Here's the thing. Like, I, if, you talk, if you talk, most of you that you're married, if you talk to your spouse the way that, I've, that a lot of us talk to God, I know that I talk to God sometimes, I'm just telling you your relationship would not be that great. Because so often we come to God and we are just asking him for a lot of different things that we think are important. But we, we don't really spend the time to gather like, God, what's important on your heart? What do you want from me? And so I think it's important to frame this question, not just what do you desire from God, but, but the word says that he will give you the desires of your heart. What's the desire that God has that he wants for you? And what are you asking for? If there's anything that you could ask from God, what is the one thing that you would ask for? Uh, David said it this way in Psalm 27. He says, I've asked one thing from the Lord. This I will see and remain in the house all the days of my life in order to gaze at the Lord's beauty and to search for an answer in his temple. If you think about this, like he could have asked for anything. He could have asked for, for wealth, more power, more authority. And he says, the one thing I desire is just to be in his house. What about you? Do, you? do you desire, is God's house a desire for you? Is God's house a desire for you? Do you want to be around the things of God? Maybe you struggle with that. And I want to encourage you, make God's house a desire in your life. Make your church a desire in your heart. If this isn't your church, that's okay. But you need to be invested and connected somewhere and have a desire for God's house. I think it's so important that we are a church of people that do not just consume church, but we contribute to the kingdom of God. We contribute to his house. Number four, 
in this year, what is one promise that you need to stand on? One promise. Did you know in the Bible there are 6,000 promises? Over 6,000 promises in the Word of God. And I think it's incredibly important that this year you need to get in to the Word of God. Like a couple years ago, we did the year of the Bible, but that wasn't like, hey, this could be cool, like trendy for a year. Maybe this is a good idea. I don't know. Like, I think it's a good idea every year. And in fact, we are still in the year of the Bible right now. But this is why this is so important, because if you are not invested in the word of God, you won't know what the promises are. And if you don't know what the promises are, how are you going to find your promise? How are you going to find the thing that you're going to stand on? From time to time, somebody will call me and say, Pastor James, I need a verse. I need a verse for my marriage or finances. Or I need a verse for raising kids or, you know, uh, what's a verse that will encourage me because the Razorback stinks so bad right now. I'm like, I got nothing for you, you know. It's... And I will, here's the thing. I will give them that verse because it's kind of part of my job description. Like, I kind of need to do that when people ask me for a verse. But you know it's so much more powerful? It's when they are in a place of desperation before God where they grab the word and they go in the presence of God and say, God, I'm not leaving and I'm not giving up until you give me my promise, until you give me my verse, until you give it to me. Because when you get to that place, there's two things that are gonna happen in your life. The first thing is you will never forget that promise. You will never forget that verse. That'll probably be something you'll get tattooed somewhere, you know? (laughs) My promise, 2018, man, I got it. But you will also see the power of that promise working in your life. And we need that. Psalm 56, 9 says this. Then my enemies will retreat when I call on you. This I know. God is on my side. I praise the word of God. I praise the word of the Lord. I trust God. I am not afraid. David was hiding out for his life. After he had been anointed as the king, he went through a lot of difficult situations, but he had a promise deep in his soul that he stood on. Do you have that? There was a race that happened a few years ago, and we found the clip. It's not great quality because it was shot back in 2008, but... I think this race and what happens in this race to this girl running this race, uh, I think it's, it's a great illustration of why it's important that you have a promise. And this is, this is the, the 2008 uh, women's indoor Big Ten uh, six, 600 meter race. So it's Big Ten, so it's not super competitive, but it's still like, <laughs> but it's still college, you know, so that's good. Get you some. But what she is able to do in this race, uh, it took something inside of her deep. Let's watch it. Just coming by Fondor now in the home stretch, heading into the bell lap. Oh, 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 down. Well, Gordon and falling down gets up quickly, but that's going to cost her. Lucky she wasn't injured. Her teammate just went to the front, though, so they may be able to recover from that. And Dorden is flying down the back She is she catching is, up. She is going to catch Von Dor, and she may catch the leader. Wow. But she's got fun. This is a gutsy effort by Dorden. Can she pull it off? She's moving to third. Dorden coming down the stretch from the outside. Dorden coming on strong. Dorden all the way. Dorden. Yeah. Oh, she did it. Wow. Wow. Unbelievable. <laughs> Okay, so you know what you just felt inside of you because you know you all wanted to cheer. (laughs) You have to know this. When you fall and get back up, all of heaven feels that for you. That's what your heavenly father wants to see you be able to do and not just stand up, but you need to understand this, that what she was able to do in that race What it took for her to do that did not happen in that moment. It happened before that moment, way before that moment. 
It happened over time. It took years of training and hard work. And what God is saying is, if you, if you will build on something firm, if you will have a promise to stand on, when you fall, you will be able to get back up. And not will, only will you be able to get back up, but you can win again. You can win again. You notice when she crossed the finish line, she's like, oh, yeah, no big deal. <laughs> because it was so deep rooted in her that that's who she was created to be. God wants you to know who you were created to be. Let's close our eyes, bow our heads.